What is up, theology nerds? This is Trip, and you're listening to Homebrewed Christianity. And today, on the podcast, returning is New Testament scholar James McGrath, except are we talking about the New Testament? No. Are we even talking about his two projects about to come out on the historical John the Baptist? Not yet. We are talking about science fiction. That's right, on top of all of his work uh, in the New Testament, he has been blocking and writing about science fiction and religion for years. He has a short book that really tackles the subject called Theology in Science Fiction. Check it out. And we had a conversation because I assigned his book in my most recent class at Luther Theological Seminary. Uh, It was called Pop Gods and was looking at theology and culture in pop culture, right? Uh, so, So we had this conversation about his book and it's tons of fun. Go check the book out. I hope you enjoy it. And when you hear it, you may say to yourself, wow, I like the idea of nerding out about some science fiction and such. Well, good, because he was not only um, been blogging about it for years, he's also done it live at Theology Beer Camp. And perhaps, perhaps this is just the lure. Maybe he's going to be back this year at Theology Beer Camp. How would you know? You go to theologybeer.com and you come on out October 17th to 19th to Denver, Colorado, Theology Beer Camp, over 500 theology nerds hanging out, 20-plus theologians like Ilya Dilio, John Tatomino, Brian McLaren, Diana Butler, Bess, Jorg Rieger. It's going to be pumping. It's going to be bopping, theologically speaking. And and we're going to have tons of live music. We've got more different kinds of stages this year. That it, 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 It's going to be exciting. Go to theologybeer.camp, get your ticket, come on out before the price goes up, and we're going to have ourselves some fun. Um, and, and one of the things we're even doing this year is some pre-event workshops. So if you, like like uh, James, hung out at the Geek Stage last year, maybe you did some Tolkien, some science fiction, some Star Wars, that kind of thing. Well, they're going to be getting together on the Thursday before it starts and playing uh, a, 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 a one-shot D&D campaign. But then in another room, there's going to be a pre-event workshop where some of my friends like Josh Scott and Brian McLaren are putting together a, a one-day workshop for faith leaders that uh, are, are, are going to share resources and kind of like, anyway, you get what I'm saying. There's even that this year. It's going to be exciting. Uh, Theologybeer.camp. Hope you check it out and come hang out. And if you can't come in person, you can always hang out online. Like our upcoming class, me and Tom Ward, GodAfterDeconstruction.com. We already have 10 like 30, 35 minute videos tackling 10 different topics you can use in a discussion group you can go through on your own. And then throughout April, we're going to be having uh, live sessions together with everyone in the class, but you don't have to be there live. You can send in your questions and such and then get you get the archive videos and stuff after. But you just go to GodAfterDeconstruction.com and it's donation based, including zero, right? And then you can get access to the videos immediately and get the invites to the live stream. So yeah, thanks. Thanks for considering it. Thank you, all of you that support the podcast and make it possible. I dig it. All of you members of the homebrewed community, thank you, thank you, thank you. So yeah, if you want to join it, go to homebrewedcommunity.com. Anyway, here we go. James McGrath, Theology and Science Fiction. Enjoy. Hello, everyone. Uh, This is Tripp and returning to the convo that uh, that we've had quite a few times around theology and culture and also around the new testament such is james mcgrath and very excited to 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 get to talk to you again yeah it's always great talking with you trip but especially when it's something that we both love nerding out about oh yeah oh yeah so um and and this is going to be fun because I'm, i'm putting together a series of these podcasts on uh, theology and culture, and uh, l- learning to wrestle with different parts of pop culture and taking it seriously as a dialogue partner. And so often, I think uh, th- the most popular examples of pop culture engagement in theological scare quotes are cheesy. And some of the most cheesy examples are people engaging science fiction, which I know is a deep love of yours. So, so I think it might be fun for you to say up front, what we hope not to do. When you think of engaging science fiction as a scholar of religion and as a person of faith, how should we just not do it? What should we be avoiding at all costs? Uh, 
in some ways, it's the same stuff you should avoid when you are reading the Bible. So one of the things that people sometimes do is say, you know, no matter what the story is about, no matter how, who the characters are, no matter what they do, it's like, how can I read this as essentially an allegory for Jesus, right? And there's a lot of that with sci-fi, right? People looking for or looking at Christ figures. And figures that in some way re resemble Jesus do pop up, right? And sometimes that's intentional, sometimes it's pandering, sometimes just drawing on these cultural images. But, you know, if the, the hero is throwing himself to his death, right, and it's usually a male hero that's doing this and the, a lot of the, you know, superhero, sci-fi, various things, stretching out his arms just so he makes the sign of the cross, just as he falls into the flames or whatever, and saves everybody and so on. And then manages to return from the dead. And everybody's like, oh, look, resurrection. Oh, yeah. And sure, you can make those analogies, but you know, heroes that manage to come back from the dead, you know, those are all over the place. And certainly not all of them are intending to get at you know, some kind of comparison with Jesus, you know, and some of them don't make for very good comparisons with Jesus, right? I don't know if you're going to have one of these on sort of theology and soap operas, but people come back from the dead all the time on those, right? And it's not because this is a Christ figure. or something. It's because, well, we want to tell the story and, you know, the actor or actress or whoever went to do something else for a bit and then came back and, you know, and then it's your evil twin or something like that. And there's symbolism you could get in that too. But that's, I think, really the least interesting type of engagement. Um, and I owe a lot of that insight and to an author named Doug Cowan, who's written some really great books, not just about sci-fi and how to think about religious themes, both explicit and implicit in sci-fi, but also in fairy tales, in horror, in fantasy, and in lots of genres that we like. Mm -hmm. You've made the contrast right up front that there are similar ways we can read poorly our biblical texts, which is, uh, you know, half of what you blog about, what you uh, professionally teach about in the guild and such. Uh, and, and we can take those same kind of uh, poor readings into reading science fiction. When you think of a text, be it a science fiction text, mm -hmm. could be written or visual video game or a movie or a comic book or whatever. Um, when you think of that genre of science fiction, just like the genre of a biography of Jesus or a epistle of Paul or these kind of things, what are the kinds of elements of that genre you think are real important to get on the table or maybe even apocalyptic literature if it's revelation, right? Like what are those things that if you learn to read the text well for its genre, uh, kind of help you start out on the right foot or, or getting the right ears to hear of sorts? Yeah. So there's a long history, particularly with the parables, but eventually it gets applied to just about any text you can imagine of ignoring the surface level of the story in order to treat it as symbolic of something else. Right. And the, the broad heading for that applies in nine out of 10 instances is uh, allegory, right? Allegorical interpretation, allegorization. And, you know, I remember, I still remember a sermon, so clearly it can be memorable, right? Where, you know, you have the story of, you know, Elisha and the axe head that floats and things like that. And it was like, you know, they're concerned because it was borrowed and saying, you know, well, this weighty metal represents the Holy Spirit and we should remember the Holy Spirit is borrowed and stuff like that. And it's like, yeah, yeah I mean, you can get a sort of a, a meme that'll stick in somebody's mind, but it has nothing to do with what the text was actually about. And if you want to say that the Holy Spirit is borrowed, rather than taking a text that's not about that and reading that into it, why not just say that, right? I mean, what do we actually get? You know, how do we appreciate superhero movies or Star Trek or Star Wars or Lord of the Rings or whatever else we might want to talk about in any genre by reading Jesus into it and finding him where he's not there? I think it's much more interesting to ask, yeah, what does this story actually say about religion? And when it comes to Star Trek, a lot of people have this perception that it's it's a very secular franchise, right? And in some ways it is. And yet it's clear that these people know the stories, right? They keep making references to them. Uh, we have Captain Kirk discussing attributes of a deity. Uh, and so we know that his theology is that, you know, a god needs compassion, but not a starship, you know, and things like that. And you know, looking at that, how is this character defining God, right? That they're saying this, right? Why can't a powerful alien be a deity? Right? Who says? You know, what's the theological framework for that? By actually looking at what the text is saying, even if we disagree with it, 
then I think we have something substantive that we can sort of sink our teeth into, that we can think about. And we can learn by saying, oh, that's interesting, I never thought about that, or, oh, that's a challenging question, or, yeah, this is a really lame view, or this is unsubstantiated, or whatever. And all of those things, I think, help us think through theological questions and theological themes in a useful way. So you, you end up doing your PhD in the New Testament and yeah. uh, spending a lot of time blogging and writing and such around science fiction. Well, what's the origin story of you becoming a science fiction nerd? Like when was there a particular story or moment or kind of plot line or something where uh, it, like the text seized you, even if it's not a written text, you know, the cultural text that seized you where you're like, oh, I got to take this seriously. And there's something that happens in discussing and wrestling with this text that I, I, I want to cultivate. Yeah. Um, a student would probably write in the essay, since time began, you know, such and such. Right. Um, but it seems that way for me. Right. Because it goes back as far as I can remember. Right? So my earliest toys are, you know, Star Trek and Star Wars action figures, things like that. Earliest memories of, of watching television are things like Star Trek and, um, Twilight Zone and things like that, going back and just for the record, you know, it's not that I'm old enough to have seen these when they first aired, but there were these things called reruns that uh, some of us are old enough to remember, which now are, you, you mean you streamed that, you know, you know, at your leisure when you wanted to? No, no, you had to actually wait until the thing was on TV. A lot of the technology that we have now was science fiction then. And I think seeing that happen, if you are somebody who was already a fan of the genre, you know, it gets to be really exciting. You imagine, you know, if you're a bit of a, a nerd and, you know, a bit awkward, introverted, and so perhaps not the best at making friends as you're growing up, uh, preferring sometimes to live in stories in your imagination. Some of that might be, yeah, it would be great to go off into space and leave this planet behind where um, I'm not quite as popular. And presumably on a spaceship, if it was part of a team that's exploring, I would be, you know, and who knows. And so, you know, we get into these imaginary worlds for a variety of reasons, but I, ha I had a, definitely a, a sort of a rediscovery of the genre as I was doing some commuting uh, soon after moving back to the States and taught in Romania for a few years. And coming back to the States was commuting between a few places, taking train journeys, and that meant there was time to read, including reading for pleasure. And so what did I do? I said, I know what genre I want to catch up on. And so that was when I finally read Frank Herbert's Dune for the first time. And I was like, oh my God, you know, imagine what human religions have turned into thousands, tens of thousands of years into the future. It's just such a useful and fascinating exercise, right? Even if you don't think what he comes up with is realistic, the very thought process is useful, right? And one thing I often mention to students is, you know, if you are involved in some sort of church or denomination, you'll have seen a timeline of church history. And it keeps going, keeps going until it reaches your denomination when suddenly they get everything right. And that's sort of the end of the story. Well, yeah, the return of biblical Christianity. Right. You know, with well, whoever, you know, and everyone saying that, right? There we go. Yeah. Finally. Well, since we both grew up Baptist, there's 40,000 versions of the return of biblical Christianity, <laughs> uh, all established in the splitting of a small church. 40,000 Baptist versions. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, obviously we narrowed it to the correct ones, but then. <laughs> and. Imagining it in the future, right? You know, I mean, Doctor Who, where you have people singing, you know, celebrating Christmas and singing hymns and, you know, on faraway lands. I mean, what does it mean to sing on a hill far away when far away is like light years away, right? You know, those are the kinds of things that science fiction can help us think about. And it's so easy not to notice that religions change over time, right? That the Christianity we have now, even the one that says it's rediscovering preserving biblical Christianity, whatever, it's not doing that, right? It's changed. It is modern, maybe slightly postmodern, but often old-fashioned modernism, right? Um, much, at, at least as much as it's anything biblical. And so stories that help us, thought experiments that help us think about that, recognize that there's no way that the future of Christianity is going to look exactly as it does today, helps us put our own time, our own era, and what we do today in perspective in what I think are useful and just fascinating and interesting to explore ways. Mm -hmm. So when you uh, first started blogging and actively engaging the 
what's happening in the cultural zeitgeist of you know of sorts uh, in science fiction. What did you learn about the kinds of conversations those narratives enable and equip compared to right when you're when you're blogging about your you know, biblical studies and such like that? Like, how would you kind of compare and contrast the public discourse? And, you know, in an ongoing kind of popular blog. Yeah. So those who know my blog today and are, have discovered it recently know it as religion prof. Some may remember what it was called when it first started. And that really was what the focus was. It was called Exploring Our Matrix. And it really served two purposes. One was it was a chance to write and think out loud publicly about this genre that I loved. And in particular, the Matrix films, right? Those were... Uh, really, really engaging, interesting, and were full of not just religious symbolism, but philosophical depth to them, right? Uh, A lot of things that were classic philosophical thought experiments were here turned into, you know, a a movie with a compelling plot and bullet time, right? You know, I mean, if Descartes had had bullet time, right? I mean, think about the impact that he would have had, right? And so this is one of the things I was thinking about, but it also was a place where I started to share some of my own thoughts about the Bible, theology, my faith. And this was in the very early days of blogging. You could start talking publicly in writing. So you're being as careful as you can be in how you put things and start doing it when you're pretty sure no one's listening. Right. And then slowly, by the time anybody actually does find their way to this thing, you've gotten a bit more comfortable with that. And so it's, it's actually a useful thing. I think, one of the things that blogging can do. But again, you know, it was very easy to just say, oh, Nero, uh, Nero, Neo, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> These kinds of slips are the ones that people who do both Bible and sci-fi are liable to make. Uh, Neo, you know, he's, he's the one, right? So it's messianic overtones, left, right, and center, you know, dies and comes back. It's how much more can, I don't have to put spoiler warning for the Matri- original Matrix movie, do I? No. 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 Okay. Just making sure. Apologies to anyone who's like still hasn't seen it, but you know, I do have a question for you. Why haven't you seen it? You know, I mean, come yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we we even have a fun podcast of uh, with me, you, and uh, Donna Bowman after the the yeah. newest one. Yeah. But you know, I mean, you had this idea, the classic science science fictiony, you know, philosophical version was the brain in a vat, which itself is, you know, it's a sci fi trope. Right, Spock's brain. It's uh, you know, it's a thing you see in sci-fi movies. It's not an actual thing. It's not a real-world thing. It's taking Descartes, who had this idea of you know, well, what if I'm deceived by a demon, and saying, hey, we can do better, right? We can make this technologically at least seem plausible, and explore this question, right? Who am I? Where am I? How do my senses relate to that sense of who I am, what I am, where I am, and so on and so forth, and. I think that was probably the one of the first movies where you actually really could just hit pause, right? It was written, created, uh, choreographed, directed in such a way that they knew it's going to be on you know, DVD and stuff like that, and that people are going to pause it and look closely at things. And so there was stuff that went by fairly quickly in the movie, and yet you could go back and look and say, hey, check out you know, who's on that poster, or you know, look, at, you know, look at what floor the Oracle is on, or things like that. And it's like... Yeah. Yeah, oh, he's got Baudrillard simulacrum. on his bookshelf. Yeah, Baudrillard on his bookshelf. It's a book, Simulacra and Simulations, right, about the nature of reality. And then oh, if yeah. you can simulate reality perfectly, then the very term reality ceases to be meaningful. And the book itself, right, is not the size and shape of the actual book. And in, it's just a simulacra, right, a simulation of a book, right, because he's got this illicit software hidden inside, right? And so it's it's this brilliant detail that you probably miss the first time maybe the first three times you watch it right maybe you miss it or until you watch the audio you. commentary pardon <laughs> or until you watch the audio commentary right. yeah. and cornell west points it out <laughs> yeah and that that was actually a pretty new way of engaging with film right and it was doing things with film that students of literature you know including of the bible had done with written texts for a long time which is stop okay let's look at this detail let's look at the you know, this might seem like a throwaway line, but let's just not rush past it. Let's pay attention to it. And the fact that we can do such things with movies is, you know, is itself interesting. Mm-hmm. One of the other things that um, 
you know, throughout your time kind of engaging these texts publicly is yes, there's the engaging science fiction, but you've also spent time engaging science, like science and religion, and then, you know, fiction and religion, like the science fiction bit. Uh, you've also engaged like just science and religion, you know, without the, the fiction in there. Um, and biblical scholars regularly get all the questions about, well, is this fiction or is it true? Uh, and this kind of thing. Um, I wonder if you found there are certain uh, maybe interpretive muscles that are easier to start building when engaging a cultural text like science fiction, especially people that grow up in a religious tradition might be more allergic to or find difficult doing uh, at first to uh, biblical texts. Yeah. Some of the ones who will stop and pay closest attention to details of biblical text are sometimes those whose entire framework distorts the text, right? So you think about the sort of end time stuff where every single detail in the book of Revelation is being focused in on, but it's in order to say, well, this is that thing that happened, right? And others are more liable to sort of skim read the text and say, you know, love God, love your neighbor. And ultimately, in a lot of ways, that's more helpful, you know, if you have to choose between the two, but there are other options, right? Which is to actually just read the text carefully and say, okay, what did this mean in its original context? Right. And what it means, cultural context, even if we can't you know, reconstruct the original context or the authorial intent or stuff like that. And so, you know, learning how to read films well and television well, to pay attention to detail, to not just read things into them, but to actually listen closely to what they're saying and then engage with them to recognize that the point of doing so is not to have whatever the story is reinforce our worldview, but provide a conversation partner uh, as we formulate our own worldview. Um, those are things that oftentimes people don't do with film or television either, but certainly if you've been steeped in an inerrantist, biblicist type of approach to religious faith, those things may seem utterly foreign to the way you approach the Bible. And applying what you learn from reading books as well as watching movies and TV can actually help, I think, in that way, in some cases. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, I, I've been amazed uh, at how much uh, cultural text can open up conversations in the classroom that if you're reading religious text, people already know the answer. So why did you have to read it that well? Um, especially when teaching philosophy of religion or world religions and with undergrad students. So I've regularly used uh, oh, we're going to use these two religions, but they're, you know, it's like all of Star Wars content and all of Game of Thrones or, you know, or something like that. We're going to read these closely. Uh, and so many of the elements that you're introducing and thinking about religious studies questions or philosophy of religion questions exist in them. Um, no one is defending a doctrine when you're uh, having a nice little argument about foreign policy, violence, AI and Battlestar Galactica. Yeah, I think there's definitely, you know, your doctrines can affect that too, you know. Yeah, but but a 19-year-old isn't sitting there like getting immediately defensive like if we're like reading, you know, some some yeah. letter of Paul and they're turning him into uh an advocate of penal substitutionary atonement and uh, insisting on the filioque clause um and that kind of thing. The when you get a chance to talk to undergrad students and kind of begin a conversation around science fiction, is there a particular uh, place you like starting, like, oh, let's watch this film or this TV show or this comic book. Like, where's the place you you want to start to show them the kind of big religious, spiritual, philosophical questions that can really uh, you know, get on the table and in conversation uh, if you take the science fiction text seriously? Yeah, I mean, on the one hand, there are a lot of them, but the the instinctive answer is to say, you know, just just watch these um, sixty years of. Doctor Who or Star Trek, and we'll be ready to have a conversation then, you know, sort of thing. And oftentimes, one actually really helpful illustration is the fact that just as happens with a franchise, the same thing happens with religions. If you're new to it, these people have been doing this thing for a while, they know the stories, you know, so where do you jump in, right? How do you invite somebody into your fandom, right? That in itself is a really, really great illustration of how do you invite someone into your faith, right? Into your theological way of thinking. If somebody's already a big fan of something else, is that a help 
or a hindrance or maybe a little bit of both. So I used to have students like watch this and watch that and realize that there was so much more to watch than could ever get them to watch. And so I often will have some recommendations. There are still some. If I'm going to talk about artificial intelligence and whether an artificial humanoid can be a person, then I will still get them to watch the Star Trek Next Generation episode, The Measure of a Man, or things like that. But would also like for them to watch things like um, you know Bicentennial Man, let's say, or things like that. And there are just too many. And so what I often do is look for a short story that we all read together and then have everybody bring whatever they also know, you know, and may make some recommendations and try to get in that way, right? Because as we both know, right, you can be a huge science fiction fan, right? But if it's a fan of novels and short stories, then you could spend, you know, five or 10 minutes talking with somebody who's at the same level of absolute love for the genre as you are, and yet say, have you read this? Oh, no, I haven't read that yet. Have you read that? No, no, not that one. What about this? You know, and you go back and forth and do that thing. And you add them to your list of things that you're going to watch or listen to. So at the moment, I'm actually, when I teach my religion and science fiction course again the next time, uh, next semester, it's going to have a, a climate dystopian focus because that seems particularly pressing. In the past, I've tried to touch on everything a little bit. Uh, this time, I'm going to give it a bigger theme that, assuming that we don't suddenly solve those issues, then that may become a separate course, right? Where I do a sort of a religion sci-fi that barely touches on that and then have a climate dystopia and religion course as a separate thing. But yeah, so there are, there are a bunch of short stories that I think are illustrative. There are some that I think are uh, useful precisely because they illustrate how to engage religion in a sort of a, a superficial way, a trite way, or how authors may engage in stereotyping and things like that. And so particularly when authors are atheists, right, sometimes that shows up in a certain form. You know, you read C.S. Lewis, and he, he's better known for fantasy than for sci-fi, but he wrote, you know, a sci-fi trilogy, and it gets a little heavy-handed with his view of things, right? And so looking for ones that illustrate that so that they can, you know, say, oh, I can see the problem here, but then ones where they'll be surprised, right, that the author holds this or that view, because the author maybe is an agnostic or an atheist, but treats religion very sympathetically, right? And in a serious and substantive way. Or you have somebody who has characters that are atheists, that are compelling and you know challenging if you're a person of faith, and the author is actually a person of faith, right? And that's not something that's unique to sci-fi, right? I mean, you think of, I regularly have had students who read you know, Brothers Karamazov and would assume that Dostoevsky, it's like, Ivan's arguments are so compelling, you know, well, Dostoev that must be Dostoevsky's view. And it's like, nope. Yeah, you're in for a surprise. Yeah, I, what was it? It was, I think my sophomore or junior year of undergrad, I was in a wisdom literature class, uh, but we read The Sparrow. Mm. And The Sparrow is one of my favorite books. I read it then and then immediately read the sequel and have read it multiple times since then. Yeah. Uh, and that is like when I think of you know, like peak science fiction. Oh, there we go. Look at that. No uh, prompting. This was not planned. Not I just planned. have to have it here because of something I'm working on. So. Yeah, I, I love The Sparrow. And one of the things I it does well, which if you haven't read it, you should just go read it. It, it, it involves a uh, Jesuit priest in a faith crisis. And what happens, we actually have contact, like extraterrestrial contact, and they're going to go visit. Now, if you are uh, any way familiar with what happened last time a new world was discovered uh, and there was economically funded and religiously and religious cover provided for the interaction of uh, Western Eurocentric religious tradition and a new other, um, it, it is a chance, right, for, to, for that engagement to go differently, perhaps. And all sorts of things happen. Yeah. And for those who don't know Mary Doria Russell, the author – she was actually an academic anthropologist. Mm -hmm. And it was precisely the um, approach of the anniversary of Columbus's so-called discovery of America that 
led her to want to address the fact that when you have a first contact scenario, you're going to have misunderstanding, right? It's not avoidable. And there was no place left on Earth to really tell a first contact story. And so she ended up with Jesuits in space, right? And she's not the only one to um, have Jesuits in space. Is it Arthur C. Clarke that has the star, right? Where you have this person who's realized that, you know, is a sort of a space exploration scenario where, you know, they're investigating this supernova that wiped out this civilization. And it's one of these very short stories. There's a lot, you know, by Clark and Asimov that are almost like either parables or like sci-fi jokes, like with a, a quick punchline that don't go on for very long. But this one, you know, this person is having a crisis of faith. And since it's such a short story, I don't think this will, you know, and it, it's such an old story. I don't think it needs a spoiler warning either. But, you know, realizes that the supernova that wiped out this civilization and so that they found their, like, library and things that they shielded from it, but, you know, the civilization is gone. That supernova became the Star of Bethlehem. And this person has a crisis of faith, right? Because this thing that heralded the birth of Jesus and served as a sign to the Magi also, you know, wiped out a civilization. And, you know, what does that mean? What do you do with that, right? And... You know, whether that's a plausible scenario or not is not, you know, necessarily the question. You know, there's there's a lot of good stories that ask about, you know, the continuity of existence and afterlife, um, the Odyssey and the problem of suffering. You know, if science can explain everything, um, does that just mean that we should assume that angels and gods are actually just beings from another world with more advanced technology or who've evolved further? And those are popular sci-fi tropes, but there are also people who very worryingly treat those as like real history and um, and take them quite literally. And there's there's just so much to talk about around these stories. Well, you know, one of the things that um, I really love about it is when you start to pay attention to different parts of pop culture, or it was something that really kind of emerged right after Christendom uh, it ceases to be the primary and dominant kind of mythopoetic structure. Uh, is is we discover that human beings don't know how not to ask a bunch of the really big questions. Uh, we used to ask them uh, in a in a much more narrowed way, like using our sacred text and in our history and these kinds of things. Um, but we haven't stopped asking them. And one of the I think challenges in our cultural moment is the inability for so many people within religious traditions that have benefited, been blessed, encountered the divine and such within these particular tradition to take seriously, listen to different nuances of questions and to struggle to answer them and take life seriously outside of it. Uh, and, and that's why I find so many of these kinds of engagements with pop culture helpful is like when you take those texts seriously, then all of a sudden the conversation around life's biggest questions that humans have asked cross-culturally like we start to include people that don't have to have right. Like all the buy-in and all the familiarity with our particular sacred text and traditions. Yeah. I mean, essentially, I mean, if I had to characterize sci-fi, it's basically telling those same kinds of classic mythological stories, symbolic stories, epic stories, philosophically rich exploration stories, updated and reimagined for the scientific universe that we inhabit, but often with just a thin veneer of science, right? And so, you know, you get the Star Trek fans who will say that Star Wars is just, you know, space fantasy because, you know, the force and lightsabers. And then they immediately go to dilithium crystals and beam you up, Scotty, and it's like, yeah, okay, yeah, like that's going to work, right? Um, glad you were able to apparate off the planet there, you know, great. But often it's just magic, right? And the aliens, right, they'd be strange creatures, monsters, cyclops, medusa, you know, they're just now they're aliens, but it's the same kinds of story. And the reason is that stories about encounters with beings from up there are the way we've asked about our own place in the universe, right? And we're continuing to think about that. We're continuing to ask about that. Evolution is often a, a point of controversy between religious people and Scientists, although that's only in very narrow um, fundamentalist forms of religion and wasn't even part of fundamentalism in Christianity um, originally. Uh, so, you know, it doesn't need to be that way. But what's interesting is that you get this mythologization of evolution, right, where it's going to will eventually become the Q continuum if we can just um, 
keep our keep ourselves together for long enough. Uh, and evolution's not going to do that, right? It's not going to give us magical powers. Sorry, uh, but we 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 long for those things. And so even the people who claim to be secular and love sci-fi often show that there's this desire for magic, right? They just want it to be somehow compatible with what science reveals. And the truth is that good theology has always been engaging with our best knowledge, our best understanding of the natural world. And so these two things are not things that ought to be happening separately, right? We ought to be engaging with the stories because they're a natural place to explore the same things but communicate them to a different audience because these stories will help us frame the traditional questions in new ways and sometimes maybe even get a glimmer of deeper insight because we're, we have more knowledge and we're bringing what we know about biology or astronomy or physics into the picture. And so in so many ways, stories like these can enhance, enhance our conversation. And it's precisely because of that and because as with religious storytelling, so too with sci-fi, it's possible to do it superficially, right? Just as it's possible to read it superficially or to make it full of you know, rich things that are worth exploring. And so I've actually, as a result of teaching about sci-fi, have ended up writing sci-fi. And what I've tried to write is always stuff that's theologically interesting, you know, has characters that explore things, that talk about things, think about things in ways that are realistic, but are not superficial, are not yeah. stereotypical and help us, help us explore you know, things like the impact of technology on faith, big picture questions, big philosophical questions, and so on. Well, when you're starting something like that, uh, having spent a lot of time uh, kind of engaging science fiction, what initiates the need to, to need to respond to it in a story as opposed to, right, like talking about the science directly or the philosophy yeah. stuff or doing it exegetically with the New Testament? Like what would have been the the kind of uh, the batteries of sorts that, that make you go, Oh, let me try my hand at this, this, yeah. uh, this kind of storytelling. Yeah. I mean, part of it was having an opportunity, right. Where somebody was putting together a collection of essays and stories about the intersection of religion and space flight and approached me assuming that I would offer an essay. And I was like, would you be willing to consider a story? And they were. And so that was really where my, my publishing started. And the answer to the deeper question, why do that at all, is that, well, let me say, it's, it's what would Jesus do, right? He told stories, right? And so there's that element of it. But also, stories have the ability to engage us in ways that other kinds of discourse don't. No statistics about the likelihood that climate change will end all life on this planet will have the same impact that a dystopian novel that lets you imagine yourself into that world, will have. And often we're transformed by novels and by stories because usual history telling, unless it's getting into, you know, verging into the historical fiction and, you know, doing that sort of thing, or it's a biopic or whatever, it gives us details, but often doesn't give us the inner lives. For that, you need the novelization. You need the, the, the film version. And so telling story is useful even for those who are trying to understand the past, right? And we see the challenges when we try to do that of trying to understand the past historically and trying to imagine the future, right? Whether our interest is you know, a hopeful one or a scientific one or whatever. We can't tell a story that is authentically in ancient Greek and expect somebody today is going to understand it, right? And so we write it in English and the characters are often a lot more like us than ancient Greek people would have been. We have stories set in the distant future, but it's still in English, right? If you're an English language reader, and this applies for whatever language people are writing sci-fi in. And so we domesticate, right? And we lessen the difference. But in trying to imagine that, we, we have this chance to still experience a bit of transcendence, right? I mean, that's what stories do to us. And encountering God is all about encountering transcendence. And so it's not surprising that stories are one of the best ways we have to uh, to explore that, to mediate it, to share what we've experienced with others. Mm -hmm. Let's go with Star Trek, just because I know you have a deep love of Star Trek. Uh, but when you think of that long history and all the different shows and everything that's going on uh, in it, if someone maybe has some familiarity or haven't hasn't really dug in or just watched them and was like, oh, it's cool. 
I like these. Could you kind of uh, take us through some of the big questions and themes that are underneath the larger conversation around Star Trek? Like, uh, like when someone's like, oh, how many times are you going to read Matthew, James? I mean, do you just you read the New Testament every I've already did that. It's great. Does some stuff, tells some stories, nice to kids, not nice all the time to rich people. They kill them, come back. It's great. Um, when you hear someone like interested and open, but not sure uh, that there's a whole lot going on in it, what's your response? Like lure us to go binge watch some Star Trek. Yeah. And in fact, I would maybe discourage binge watching and say, you know, take your time with both the Bible and with Star Trek and with anything else that you're going to watch. Take the time to think about an episode before moving on to the next one, right? That's not the way we tend to watch nowadays. But you know, what you described you know, really resonates with me in terms of what I'm worried my students will do and have a penchant for doing, and that I, as an educator, really could convey to them is what they're supposed to be doing, right? Because when you quiz a student to see if they've done the reading, you ask them about the details, and so often they will go to like the cliff notes or whatever it is to you know, get the details that they you know, think are essential, that somebody has excerpted. And that's what they focus on and trying to remember enough details that they can get points on a quiz. Whereas the point of reading is the experience of reading, right? And the way that it changes us. And we still haven't come up with a good test for that, right? And everybody wants things quantified. And so you know, my answer to that is to read and reread and have the experience that you have, you know, if you're a music fan, but maybe haven't done this with the Bible or with sci-fi, when you listen to something over and over again, you notice more of the song, right? The first time it sort of washes over you. The second time you start, you know, it's like, oh, you know, I, that guitar solo is even cooler than I realized. And before you know it, you're noticing the harmonies and what the, the drummer's doing. Um, unless you're a drummer, the drum, what the drummer's doing is often the last thing, right? But it's important, right? That's part of the, the part of the whole. And so it's really hard to find a place where people can jump into a franchise. Uh, often the start of a new series of, let's say, Star Trek is a good place. Often the worst thing you can do is go back and start watching something from the beginning, right? Uh, Star Trek, Doctor Who, you, you get a sense of their age, right? If you watch the, like, the very first episode that ever aired or something like that. Uh, the special effects don't always hold up well, right? And so, you know, it's it's good that there are at least some episodes where you're sort of thrown in a little bit. Doctor Who, one that's been really touted as the way in, like the gateway drug to Doctor Who, is an episode called Blink. And it's, it's an unusual one precisely because the Doctor, who's sort of the main character, doesn't feature except sort of in a tangential sor sort of way, right? But I think... Ultimately, whether you're introducing someone to the Bible and saying, hey, you know, take a look at this, or to science fiction, you need to pick a story that's really good, but you need to be able to step back as a fan and say, okay, if somebody watches this and doesn't already know these characters, are they going to get anything out of it? You know? And sometimes even trying to do that, we might, we might guess wrong. I think ultimately it, the way it's impacted us will be the thing that makes it most compelling, right? Rather than how we summarize the story, right? As somebody who's tried to say, oh, you watch this because it's got this and then it's got that and it's got that. I think the more details that I think are really interesting about something that I share with someone who hasn't seen it, the less likely they are to <laughs> go away and watch that as a result of what I'm saying. Um, I think you need to have, allow for some mystery, you know, as you kind of tantalize somebody in. But I'm not sure, you know, maybe this is why I'm not an evangelist, you know? <laughs> Well, what I mean, I think that that's definitely a, a hard thing to do sometimes because when you are so into a particular, you know, universe or world, it, it, one of the perks of comic books is they just reset every so often. Uh, and then if you find one you love with one author, then you realize, oh, well, there's like 40 other hundred issue runs with mm -hmm. this character and such. But the I mean, I love Lord of the Rings is easily all the Middle Earth stuff has been. Very dear to me, and I used to be the obnoxious person when people just loved the movies, which I think they're great. I watch them every year, but I also read the books. And then I realized 
how many people end up reading the books and then getting to know the whole thing because they love the movies. The movies are good all on their own, even though does far me are nasty. And you know, there's, there's no Tom Bombadil, um, like Glorfindel's just cut out altogether. Like, uh, you know, there are all these little, little things and there could be a whole nother two hours of, of, uh, just Sam and Frodo dialogue yeah. that are in there. I've, you know, there's the mithril cut. There's all these rumors about coming out. That's about five and a half hours version of return of the King that I'm hope coming out, comes out on its, uh, you know, the next big anniversary. And some of us are just like, this would be the greatest thing of all time. Uh, let me go ahead and set my week to go watch it multiple times in the theater. But like I feel like like that challenge of like finding the entry point. Sometimes people watch it and rewatch it because they just can't wait for the Helm's yeah. Deep battle. And then all of a sudden, you know, these other elements start to stick yeah. out, and then the mm-hmm. conversations build on it, and then they go to the text, and then they realize, oh, you know, Aragon was singing about Baron and Luthien, and the and the hobbits didn't know who it was in Fellowship of the Ring, and he they cut that whole scene out, but like once you add it in, it like layers this whole all these questions in it, and like it opens up and such, um, and. And I wonder if, like, when you think of some of your favorite worlds in science fiction, are there, like, these particular turning points where, like, where, where someone like, gets into it and starts, like, engaging it in things, but, like, when you start talking to someone about Doctor Who or Star Trek or, or these kind of things where th- there's, like, some point where it shifts, where now instead of, like, talking about this episode or talking about this story, there's some kind of, I don't know, like, the, the mythopoetic heartbeat of any universe starts to come out. And there's like a thing that holds tricks, trick all the trick stories together. And there's this thing like when it's the legendarium or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, it, it differs from franchise to franchise. I, I think all of them have that. You know, if I think back to, you know, I have no idea what the first episode of Star Trek was that I saw, you know, because it's just lost in my memory. I do know which is the first episode of Doctor Who I saw and not a good one to start with. Right. I mean, not, you know, not in any sense, but the story itself and the characters were so compelling that I wanted more. And then I was really puzzled because it wasn't the same person playing the doctor and it took a while. Till I figured that out and they keep going into this blue box, but then there's someplace else. And what's going on? Yeah, I, I had no idea. Right. But there was clearly something interesting that I wanted to learn more about and wanted to experience more of. And I think we have to accept sometimes that, you know, there's going to be that disorientation and obviously you can start with a one of the less compelling episodes or moments or whatever and fail to fall in love with it. But ultimately, the universes that we love are usually ones where there are so many good stories that we say, just you know, pick one, just jump in and start exploring and give it some time. You know, don't judge it too quickly. But you know, if you don't fall in love with this, then you probably won't like the show. Right? I mean, I got into Lost. Uh, which is one that really, you know, there was this story arc from beginning to end and wasn't able to start watching it when it first started airing. And so I jumped in late and then went back and, you know, some stuff made more sense, but ultimately, right, it was compelling even if you jumped in. And part of that is because everybody was confused, right, (laughs) who was watching this show. And so it didn't matter if you started watching from the beginning. Next semester, I'm going to be teaching in that um, climate dystopian focused religion sci-fi course, I'm going to be teaching Margaret Atwood's The Year of the Flood, which is the second book in a trilogy. But the first book in the trilogy just throws you into this future scenario. And so throwing you into that in the second one you know, isn't, isn't necessarily a problem. Um, there are things that you might get out of reading the second one if you've already read the first one, but ultimately the story works on its own. And I think that's true in general of, you know, particularly Star Trek, and Doctor Who, which really are episodic for the most part, right? They have stories. And yes, there's a lot you don't know about the characters, and some of them there'll be references that you won't get. But it's the story is a standalone story, however long it lasts, whether it's a, several episodes long, one episode long. one, And you can jump in and not understand everything, and that's that's the nature of getting into a new universe. Yeah. In thinking about your upcoming class and and using science fiction and thinking about uh, ecological apocalypse and such, um, are, are there any particular framings or devices or narratives that, I don't know, give it a different way of hosting a conversation 
with a community of readers or viewers uh, that that you see are have you learned anything about I don't know the kind of anxieties or framings or questions mm-hmm. and such uh, that are that are being expressed in science fiction that maybe don't get a hearing if you're if you're just you know reporting the science and then battling about it say you know in the public square and politics and such yeah I mean I think it's very interesting that you know whether the author has a a positive and ambivalent or a negative view of religion in general or any religion in particular, that religion seems to pop up in these pretty consistently. And often it's fictional religion, whether it's fictional versions of some existing religion. But you know, Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower and Parable of the Talents, Margaret Atwood's Year of the Flood, Kim Stanley Robinson's Ministry for the Future to a maybe a lesser extent, but all of them envisage some sort of religious response to this ecological crisis, right, to this existential crisis for humankind, both as something that seems inevitable, right? If you have a crisis, then you're going to have a religious response to it, because that's what human beings do. You try to make sense of the world and big picture questions, or at least, you know, wrestle with them, right? And on the other hand, the idea that for this new crisis, if we're going to get people to actually do something about it, then it's going to require the kind of motivation that religion brings. It seems pretty clear by this point that just saying, accept some cramping of your you know, comfortable lifestyle uh, in order to save humanity, doesn't seem to be enough motivation for people, right? You'd think it would be. Um, and it seems as though even things that Jesus taught about caring for others and um, stuff like that would help more than it seems to in at least some cases, right? In fact, some people will point to the Bible and say, well, you see, he said he's never going to you know, flood again. And so clearly the rise of sea level is not something we need to worry about. It's like, eh, that's a problematic way of using the Bible, very self-serving use of the Bible. And there's a long history of that. But the idea that we'll need new religious motivation, new religious ways of thinking. I mean, for somebody who does theology, right, the idea that new understanding of the world, its fragility requires new theological perspectives is not at all surprising. Uh, A lot of people have never encountered that through theology, um, through reading theology, um, unless they're theology geeks, right? And there are some of us out there, but, you know, there are people who are concerned about the ecological crisis, but not discovering theological resources that can help or imagining where they might go with their own religious tradition or invent a new one or do any of those things. And so, the fact that this features in these stories, I think, is fascinating. Yeah, and, and one of the things that I find helpful is that oftentimes, if the conversation is a religion and science one, then the parts of reality that are on the table are the elements that we can get at through the scientific method. Now, I think that's really important on this issue, both in understanding, you know, the consequences and how we even like anticipate when you get to a feedback loop of sorts when it goes to environmental things, but also the psychological sciences and how we uh, make meaning and cooperate, uh, how we uh, animate human beings, how you have systemic change um, and all these kinds of elements. Those, those can all be there. But the the impact of so many big issues of kind of scientific framing on so many big issues is to take out large amounts of what animates human beings, both individually and communally. But you can't tell a good story if humans don't buy the narrative of what's animating the different characters. Yeah. Right. And the, the ministry of the future, I would say it's like an amazing book, except for that. It's terrifying. It is a nightmare text that after reading it, you go, oh, no, this That's makes it. way too much sense, I, which yeah. maybe say something about it in case people don't know. But yeah, um, so it was interesting. I mean, you talk about terrifying. I started listening to that audiobook, and right around the same time, there was that recent uh, heat wave in India, which I mean, is the scenario that the story starts with. Right. And so I'm listening to this audiobook of a story previously written. And here, what it's describing is, you know, not quite unfolding on the news, but almost. I mean, it's like, you know, people talk about prophecy and often think it's just about predicting the future, you know, and rather than speaking to the present. But, you know, there is an element, right, both in the classic religious sense of prophecy and in sci-fi as a prophetic genre 
of saying, this is where we're at. This is where what we're doing now has us heading. Repent, right? Uh, turn around, get off the course, point in a different direction, or otherwise there will be dire consequences. And the ancient prophets you know, weren't doing the same thing that modern sci-fi authors are in every respect. Uh, maybe the writers are apocalyptic a little bit, but you know, but they are looking at what's happening. It's easy to forget that someone like Jeremiah had seen some exiles carried off already, and he could see where things were headed. He clearly had this sense of what God felt about what the nation was doing, but also this deep concern for his people, right? And that there's going to be disaster, there's going to be destruction. And, you know, there's a lot of that in sci-fi, particularly in the dystopian uh, elements of things. On the other hand, I think that, you know, Ministry for the Future is actually, you know, in a lot of ways more hopeful than a fair amount of dystopian sci-fi because it depicts humanity actually trying, right? People actually saying, we have a shot, it might be too late, but we're going to try some stuff. And some of that stuff, you know, you ask an economist, okay, could they do this? And they might say, well, no, it probably wouldn't work. Or, blah, blah, blah. But there's this genuine attempt, people get behind it. You find ways of motivating people for whom profit is always going to <laughs> dominate. You know, you, you figure out ways of getting governments involved in ways that even people who worry about big government, you know, are liable to maybe just maybe be able to be persuaded can go, they can go along with it. And so I, I found it ultimately hopeful, uh, even though it was also terrifying, particularly given what was on the news as I was listening to it. Mm -hmm. Well, it is a really good audiobook. which if someone's wanting to check it out, yeah. uh, because there are multiple different voices in the text itself, they have different people read it rather compellingly uh, in the audiobook. The thing that freaked me out about it is how, believable all the kinds of eco-terrorism stuff mm -hmm. and then the security state trying to resist it and, and violence and surveillance all those kinds of things are sitting there where i don't think people sometimes i think it requires science fiction or maybe a good zombie apocalypse story or something like that for us to get just how fragile humanity uh, not going for the throat all the time and having non-stop wars is um and w what happens when the increasing number of people don't find our current uh setup viable and f plausible for their future and their children's future um you know that's always led to ugly stuff in history but the uh consequences at this point are higher and the technology for doing violence is uh more significant and that leads to very graphic, depressing dreams, James. You yeah, know? it can. Yeah. And I think when we think about some of these issues and th there's this stream of thought that will blame the Bible and religion for some of the exploitation of the natural world. Mm -hmm. But you know, when the author of Genesis wrote, you know, rule, rule over the world, have dominion over it, apart from debates about the meaning of the word, the connotation, blah, 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 blah. There, there's no technology that allows you to exploit the earth the way we can now. And so ruling over the world is, you know, taking land that's becoming overgrown, you know, when you've, it's, this is a text that's probably written in the context of exile and people returning from exile and saying, you know, you have the authority to take this stuff that's overgrown and turn it back into farmland. You know, you have the, you know, and that's not dangerous in the way that ruling over the world, having dominion, treating the natural world casually as some people do, you know, and so recognizing that there's a difference in context, that the text is not speaking straight to us in our time. I, I've often wondered if that's why, as somebody who does biblical studies, I also love sci-fi so much, is that you know, all of this you know, academic study of the Bible and trying to understand it, exploring science fiction, it's all about recognizing that different times are different, imagining the ways that they're different, recognizing that going back or going forward, there's only our imagination to guide us and some little bits of evidence, you know, that can help along the way. You know, and, and that's part of our faith if we're Christians, right? Because we have these texts, these stories, we have Jesus, you know, and part of what people have always done is not just tell the story, pass on like historical details, but to give story and say, you know, were you there when they crucified my Lord? And offer an invitation to 
see ourselves in the story, find ourselves, you know, imagine ourselves into the story. And so for all the very conservative religious folks who think that imagination and biblical truth or something like that, religious, you know, truth, gospel truth are at odds. In fact, if your focus is such that you're excluding imagination, then you're excluding the life transforming power that stories can have. Yeah, that's really important. Well, okay. So this has been a lot of fun and I am not, I'm not confident. I've asked all the best questions. So if, if people are enjoying this and thinking about um, what's going on in science fiction and taking it seriously, like, what should be my last question, James? You know, to, uh, get, you, to get you to talk about yeah. the thing you're sitting there going, like, why hasn't he brought up? Yeah. Well, ask me, ask me what I've written because uh, that always. Are you going to give us like the trailer or something? Yeah, I'll tell you a little bit about a couple of the stories. Oh yeah. You know, because uh, I mean, I've I've written like a book, theology and science fiction. You know, yes, uh, a brief guide for exploring this. But I've been writing science fiction, you know, because I think there are topics worth exploring and. Even ones that have been explored in the past, I think they're sometimes worth exploring again in this, at least a slightly different way. Mm-hmm. And so in theology and science fiction, you know, that was another place where I seized the opportunity to not just write about sci-fi, but to write some sci-fi and to share some stories. And that was where I finally got around to writing a short story uh, that's called Certainty that really gets at that question you know, that you wrestle with as a historian working on the historical Jesus as I do. You know, okay, if I had a TARDIS, right, if I had a time machine and could go back, what would I see, right? And if I saw this, that, or the other, what would it do to my faith? Uh, the story itself was actually inspired by a conversation I had with an atheist on my blog. And the atheist said, you know, well, I'm going to try and prove to you that your faith is not falsifiable and therefore it's not, you know, there's, it has no value. Uh, here's a TARDIS, here's a time and space machine. You can go anywhere you want. What would it take to make you lose your faith? And thinking that through, I realized that, you know, if I go and see the Romans throwing Jesus' body to the dogs, well, how does that have any bearing on whether God could justify Jesus beyond death, right? I mean, ultimately, people who tried to burn martyrs' bodies and scatter the ashes on a river, you know, prevent the resurrection. I don't think that works, right? You know, whatever one's view of afterlife and things like that. And so I realized that, you know, maybe there's something that's unfalsifiable, but that's true regardless right, of what we might determine, right? And I realized that actually seeing what Jesus was like as a person, what his character was like, would probably be more important to me. But even then, if I found that Jesus is not somebody that I am comfortable following, right, a lot of people say, well, if I wasn't a Christian, I'd be an atheist. It's like, why? There are so many options, right? And maybe atheism is the right one for you, but why not Judaism? Why not Buddhism? Why not deism? Why not this, that, or the other, right? And so that helped me realize that my faith is something much deeper and bigger than any Christian doctrines. And so this atheist really helped me, you know, helped cement my faith in a way that I know they, that this person was not <laughs> intending. I was grateful for it. But I tried to explore in a story, you know, give somebody a, a time machine and say, you know, if they go back, what might happen? And I think I did manage to do something at least a little different than some of the other stories. But I also highly recommend some of the other stories that have been told about this. Uh, there's a great one, Let's Go to Golgotha, right? That's uh, about time travel tourism to uh, go see the crucifixion. Uh, Michael Moorcock wrote Behold the Man. And you know, more recently, I've, I have things about like an effort to terraform Mars and religion coming into one of the conversations. Uh, robots in church and how technology like chat GPT and other things might impact religious communities. And I try to write stories that help people think about those kinds of issues in ways that are sensitive to the faith, not pandering to it, but also not, you know, antagonistic to it, you know, generally as a person of faith, but who hates oversimplified versions of my own faith, never mind anybody else's, to give something that engages in a deeper way, sometimes in a subtler way trying not to put anything in there that's heavy handed, but nonetheless to get at what I think are some really important issues, because there's a lot about, you know, can an Android be a person, right? There's a lot less about what happens if chat GPT can write a sermon. And I think we need some sci-fi stories that uh, address those kinds of questions as well, because uh, if we can't navigate the near future ones, then the more distant future ones, May, we may never get the chance to uh, wrestle with those issues. Mm-hmm. 
do you give the what would you go back to um you know as like like a question in your new testament class it's like the bonus question on a test just to just to see what they would pick cuz that's like, that's kind of fascinating to know what what someone would pick yeah um i've i've used it in my religion and science fiction class right and shared it with them um i think i've also sometimes used it when i've taught a first year seminar class but you know, I think it's I think it's useful, at least in figuring out are there historical moments that are important to your faith? What would happen if you saw something other than what you expect to see? You know, I think that as a thought experiment really is one that's important. And I think it does help us to get at the question of what's important because sometimes what we think is crucial actually isn't. And I mean, for a lot of us, you know, we were told at some point that you know, oh, if you you know, you lose biblical inerrancy and everything's gonna go out the window, and it's like, no, it didn't exploring things, asking deeper questions, you know, doesn't have to be something threatening. And sci-fi helps us do that, I think, in lots of lots of important ways. Yeah. I, I mean, I had a similar thought about the crucifixion and resurrection stuff, uh, but the two places I would try to decide, and I, you have to have the ability to translate. You have to have right. something where you're going to hear it because he's going to be talking in Aramaic and my Greek wasn't even that good to begin with. Now you, you maybe do a little better uh, on this, but philosophical theologians, not going to be a conversational Aramaic is not on our table. Um, but I either wanted like close enough to hear like where you can be with people while Jesus is telling the story. So you like see what happens, like yeah. how good a storyteller do you have to be that people tell stories about your stories forever and debate their interpretations. I want to know what it's like to be in the audience when he holds them and you're uncomfortable with like anyone holding everyone's, you know, that close or like last supper, like whatever happened Mm -hmm. in Holy week where he's with the disciples, be it wash feet meal, you know, whatever it is like being rather confident on the deliberateness of provocation on Jesus, like what he did in, later moments of intimacy with his friends. Like, and if, if you get permission in your weird thing, just to be, you know, be sitting at the table or whatnot, I think if I was writing a story, I think it'd be fun. You're going back and you want to receive the Eucharist. He doesn't do it at all, but he does wash the feet and you're trying to decide what to do since he didn't even serve the Eucharist that night. And that's, you know, you're, like you're just like he didn't even say this is my body blah 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 but then he comes to wash your feet and you don't know what to do uh you're sitting there going yeah. this is what we're doing what what, what about you, you know yeah yep. but what are you gonna do tell jesus no you used well, your one chance and now you're not even gonna let <laughs> yeah and you know you you have to park your uh time machine somewhere you know out of sight you can't just appear in the you know the upper room and so you do so and uh inadvertently lead the you know, lead the authorities to um, where Jesus is on the Mount of Olives, you know, as a result of doing that. And then, you know, there are all kinds of, it's you know, all your fault. Time, right. Uh, there's just so many stories that one could tell. I, I mean, I think it's a good assignment one could use in a religion science fiction course, like semester after semester and have people, you know, do interesting things with it. Yeah. That's a lot of fun. Well, I always have fun talking to you, James. Likewise. I really appreciate it. And, um, you mentioned earlier about when you go watch old stuff and then you get distracted by the technology. I just want to know there's one exception is that there's a whole group of people that really love the unedited original trilogy of Star Wars and don't find the technological additions and story modifications as necessary. Like if you're going to be like a KJV only Christian, then you you know the vibe here is that there's like one preferred version of it. And I can't really do that about the Bible, but when it when it goes to the original trilogy, I think the best place starts episode four is if you're gonna if you're new to Star Wars, and you don't need Jabba the Hutt showing up uh, randomly with his little slug computer and random little thing. And Han shot first. Like I just think that's a episode four is where you're supposed to start, unless you're indoctrinating kids early and they can't watch it. So you use this Lego Star Wars. No. Yeah, I mean if if you, if you think about stuff like the creation stories. It's like, yeah, this needs a reboot, right? Because, you know, it's got all this outdated, you know, ancient Near Eastern stuff in here that's like, you know, 1960s special <laughs> effects, right? And, you know, it, there there are interesting parallels we could make there too, right? It's not exactly the same thing. Uh, but I, you know, I explore 
the the questions of canon and textual criticism and you know things like that and use you know in my my new book a to z of the new testament i actually have a reference to han shot first right because it's basically a question of textual criticism right and i use that to help my students assuming they're star wars fans or no star wars fans or know enough about this to get the reference we have different versions of the same sacred text as it were even all all directed and edited by the real author yeah he's unsure but maybe that is like a good thing. Well, if the Holy Spirit really wrote all four Gospels with the evangelist, it was like, uh, well, I might give it a little update. I'm going to give it an update here. Yeah. This it's time the genealogy is different on purpose. Yeah. Director's cuts, reboots, things like that. Yeah. That would be a fun way of, it would be fun to explore that. You know, I, <laughs> well, let's just hope the church doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't sell the canon to Disney. <laughs> Who, no one wants to know. What they do all of a sudden they they instead of like Star Wars land they got like uh, the Galilee land and you're you're walking around getting smacked around by a centurion. You don't want to see what the sequel would be like. No, <laughs> all of a sudden, they were like uh, Judas was cloned and now all the demons of Legion that were cast out fill his body and now uh, well, how are we going to do this? What what's going to happen? Jesus episode 742. Uh, I don't think so. Though, though I have to say, some of those non-canonical gospels get pretty close to doing like we don't once you get a talking cross and some other stuff. Yeah. Well that's maybe we'll save those stories for a whole other time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes. All right. <laughs> Whoa, you made it all the way to the end of the podcast. I dig it. I appreciate it. If you want to make this possible, go to homebrewedcommunity.com. You can donate each month. You'll get access to all sorts of goodies. And we are just months away from launching some super cool perks for all the homebrewed community uh, that, that y'all don't even know about yet. But be, 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 be on the advanced team. Help me uh, keep this going. Providing the audiological goodness to the people. Thank you. <laughs>